So just so that you know, we're going to start in just, un just under a minute uh, once the number of participants settles down and then we'll, we'll get down to business. So if you're not presenting, uh, um, if you could just make sure that your microphone and your camera are both turned off. I think they all are, but. Okay, let's make a start. So thanks very much for coming to speak to us today, uh, Rachel. It's a pleasure to, to welcome you to the Kennedy Tower, the, the virtual form of the Kennedy Tower. Um, so Rachel Wood is an NHS consultant in public health. She works as a public health doctor for Public Health Scotland, and she's a reader at the University of Edinburgh's Usher Institute and the Centre for Clinical Brain Sciences. Um, she directs Scotland's congenital anomaly register and undertakes research into maternal and child health using routinely collected data. Uh, she's also been involved with Public Health Scotland's COVID-19 National Incident Response, which is the work I think that she'll be focusing on in her talk today. So I think that's a, a, enough by way of introduction. Thanks for coming to speak to us and uh, over to you, Rachel. Thank you very much, Andrew. So I'll just um, share my screen. So hopefully you can start to see the slides. Just let me know if that's OK. Perfect. That's perfect. apart from not perfect because now I can't move the slides on. Oh, there we go. <laughs> so um, thank you very much for the introduction. So what I'm hoping to cover today is uh, to give you a sense of Public Health Scotland and the routine data that we hold and how we've used that to support the national response to the COVID pandemic. And I'm going to speak specifically about uh, the national case control study that we're running, a national cohort study, uh, and our work on the wider impacts uh, of COVID, uh, so beyond the direct effects of infection, and our contribution to international studies. So starting off thinking about um, Public Health Scotland and uh, the routine data that we hold. So with um, with impeccable timing, really, Public Health Scotland was formed on the 1st of April last year, uh, and we represent with the coming together of three legacy organisations, including the NHS Scotland Information Services Division, or ISD, uh, where I used to work. So PHS is now our single national public health agency. And we have responsibility for all aspects of public health. So that's health protection, health improvement, health care, public health, and maintaining our national public health data and intelligence function. And of course, we've had a key role in um, the national COVID response over the last year. So both the prior organisations and public health, now Public Health Scotland, prior to COVID, we, there are a lot of national uh, data sets that are already in existence and held by those organisations and available for analysis. So I've just focused here on some that have been particularly important over uh, in our response to COVID. So there are already, for example, uh, routine returns um, from lab test results from uh, virology, uh, NHS virology labs across Scotland. Whenever a patient is discharged from an episode of inpatient hospital care, whether that's from a general maternity or mental health setting, uh, a record of that return comes to Public Health Scotland. There was a pre-existing audit of all critical care admissions, again, with us holding that six-act data. And there are established processes in place whereby national records for Scotland share um, statutory uh, vital event registration uh, records, death, birth and death records with us on a regular basis. And from my point of view, there's also a range of specialist data sets relating to maternal and child health. And importantly, we don't hold the CHI database, but PHS also has access 
to the CHI database. Um, that's essentially the NHS Scotland Master Patient Index uh, with every patient registered with a GP uh, included in the database with their CHI number. And that helps us link together data from uh, that relate from multiple data sets that relate to the same patient, allowing us to look and um, do more complex analyses and follow individuals over time. But that's well and good. That's our existing or pre-existing data. But actually developing new data flows, either regular data flows or one-off data transfers into Public Health Scotland uh, has been a key part uh, of our response to the pandemic. So, for example, although there are, are existing processes around uh, returns from NHS virology labs, all of a sudden you have um, swabbing going on in airport car parks and um, lighthouse labs processing tests and needing to set up new data flows to ensure that all those results also come into PHS. We've set up a big um, program of uh, serology testing residual blood samples for SARS-CoV-2 antibodies to understand the proportion of the population overall that's been exposed uh, to the virus. Uh, it, and those serology test results um, are also now flowing through to PHS. And I'll emphasize these are blood samples taken as general clinical care, not because patients have COVID. We've developed and maintained the national shielding list. Um, we're central to delivery of test and protect and uh, holding the information that's generated through that contact tracing process. More recently developing uh, new data returns on COVID vaccination. And other, uh, other more bespoke things, for example, last year, the uh, the pop, uh, property reference number was added to the CHI database. So that, um, based on individuals' address, so that's a unique reference for every single address in Scotland. And that lets us uh, identify individuals that live within the same household and then uh, examine within household transmission of infection. We've um, statutory live birth registration was disrupted at the start of the pandemic and we had to develop an alternative feed of information on babies that are being born. We developed a new return, a weekly return from boards on women booking for antenatal care, which lets us know about women who are pregnant in the population um, at a much earlier stage rather than waiting for their end of pregnancy delivery record and then knowing retrospectively about a pregnancy. And we've also had some bespoke um, data sets around occupational groups and from uh, extracts of GP data for specific projects that I'll talk about later. So I just want to emphasize though that although there's been a, a lot of new data flowing in response to the pandemic, and um, the normal governance rules still apply. So it's important to be clear that we are still legally and um, ethically required to ensure that uh, the data that we're receiving and holding and analyzing uh, is in line with confidentiality and common law and confidentiality and the law around data protection and individuals' rights. So any new data that comes into Public Health Scotland is subject to a data privacy impact assessment process. And uh, when we want to link different data together to, um, for the purpose of research projects, we're obliged to seek approval from the public benefit and privacy panel in the same way that um, external academic groups would be required to. So moving on now to think more about how we've used uh, the data for, uh, to inform our response to the pandemic. And I'm talking initially about the national case control study that's been established um, known as REACT. So REACT is an incidence density case control study so every, um, what that means is as cases of COVID accrue in the population, they are incrementally added 
to the study database. And by a case of COVID, I mean anyone testing positive um, for a viral PCR test or anyone with a hospital record or a death record that's um, coded to COVID, uh, even if they didn't have a positive test. And whenever a case of COVID is added to the database, 10 matched generation, general population controls who, who are not cases, at least up until that point, are also added to the database. And the data um, that is added provides information on uh, basic demographic characteristics, age, sex, deprivation, ethnicity, and so on. And there's also individuals have prior admission and prescription records added to REACT that give us information on their pre-existing health status and also prospective admission, including critical care admission and death records are added to provide information on individuals' outcomes. So REACT was used, was set up very quickly um, at the beginning of the pandemic, and it was used early on to examine and quantify um, factors that were being discussed as probable risk factors for severe disease back at the start of the pandemic. It's quite hard now to think back to how uncertain we were about some of these things last spring. Um, and this shows uh, summarizes some of the results from one of the papers that's been um, published from the REACT study. And I've added QR codes uh, which provide direct links to uh, relevant papers if people are interested in following that up. And this shows amongst the cases and the controls within REACT the um, percentage of individuals that have the demographic and clinical risk factors um, of interest and the adjusted rate ratio associated with the risk factors. This obviously being the risk, examining the risk of severe COVID. That's COVID um, that was severe enough to require admission to critical care or causing death. And as was becoming um, evident early on in the pandemic, um, residence in a care home was an extremely strong risk factor for fatal COVID, independent risk factor. Many of the um, specific pre-existing comorbidities were also confirmed as conferring a more moderate uh, increase in risk of severe disease. But equally, um, just any marker of frailty or illness, so any prior prescription or any prior admission, were also found to be independent risk factors for severe disease, indicating that um, a wide range of underlying conditions confer increased vulnerability to severe infection. Then the REACT, uh, there's been a number of what you might call spin-off projects from the core REACT study. And one important stream of that work has been examining risk in specific occupational groups. So uh, the routine health records within REACT don't contain any information on individuals' occupation. So uh, PHS, we have been provided with two bespoke population-based occupational data sets to enable this work. The NHS boards across Scotland provided basic demographic information on all individuals employed by the NHS uh, in Scotland and plus GPs contracted to work for the NHS. And the General Teaching Council for Scotland provided um, information on registered active teachers. So we've indexed those occupational data sets with individuals' CHI numbers, and that, uh, and we also then uh, identified household contacts of healthcare workers and teachers through the population reference number that I described. And we've linked that additional occupational and household information into the REACT database. And that has let us examine the risk of any COVID, COVID requiring hospitalization, that was the primary outcome of interest, and severe COVID uh, according to 
occupational and household um, factors. What this graph shows is the cumulative risk of COVID requiring hospitalisation from the beginning of the pandemic up to um, the beginning of January this year. It's the absolute risk of COVID requiring hospitalisation in women and men uh, and in increasingly older age groups. The risk for the general population is in black, the risk for teachers is in pink and then healthcare workers is in blue. What we can see is that the risk is generally higher in men than women, generally higher in older groups than yeah, younger groups. But in addition to that, the risk in the teachers, it, certainly in the younger groups, is broadly similar to that in the general population, perhaps um, somewhat elevated in the, uh, just in the oldest age group. But the risk in healthcare workers is uh, consistently and substantially um, higher than that seen in the general population. And this is a slightly complex slide that then summarises the adjusted risk of COVID um, in healthcare workers, uh, teachers and their household members. And the analysis has been split into the uh, period up to the end of August, roughly before when schools were closed, uh, or you, for the healthcare workers, you can think of that as sort of first wave. Um, and then from September onwards, when schools have been reopened, uh, or second wave infections for healthcare workers. And if we focus on teachers, first of all, the green dot and error bar is showing us the results for any COVID, the sort of brownie orange is showing the risk of COVID requiring hospitalisation and the black is severe COVID. Um, um, prior when schools were closed, the risk of all outcomes in teachers and their household members was similar to that in the general population or lower. And that broadly remains true when schools have reopened, apart from the risk of any COVID in teachers, which is slightly elevated. And that um, possibly reflects very high uh, rates of testing in uh, these, this occupational group. And by contrast, if we look at the healthcare workers um, in the early stages of the pandemic, uh, you might notice that there's no green um, dot for the healthcare workers here, and that's because it's off the scale at a rate ratio of nearly nine. Healthcare workers were at very, very much elevated risk of any COVID. And that's uh, likely to an extent also to reflect their high access to testing, but also some genuinely increased risk. And the risk of them having COVID severe enough to require hospitalization or um, critical care admission or death, uh, they, healthcare workers were and their household members in the early phase of the pandemic were at a two to three increased risk. That risk is somewhat attenuated um, in the later phases of the pandemic, but healthcare workers remain at uh, at least a twofold risk uh, of uh, COVID. Um, luckily, the risk in their household contacts uh, has attenuated more to be similar to that scene in the general population. And of course, these results have been important in informing um, response to how uh, infection control, guidance and so on in different settings. I'm going to go on now to talk about uh, the national cohort study, that's EVE 2. And EVE 2 is EVE 2 because it's uh, essentially a resurrection of a former um, initial EVE study, which was set up in the, uh, during the swine flu pandemic in 2009-10 to examine the um, antiviral and vaccine effectiveness against that infection. And since then, it's been um, dormant as a sleeper study as part of the NIHR pandemic preparedness research portfolio. So, Eve was resurrected as Eve 2 at the start uh, of the COVID pandemic. 
And EVE 2 is a huge study, really. It's an entire population cohort. So the foundation stone of EVE 2 is an initial data extract from all GP practices across Scotland back at the um, start of the pandemic, providing basic demographic and comorbidity information on all patients. And again, that's been linked then to a wide range of uh, existing data sets similar to those used in REACT, uh, but also including a more recently vaccination data in the EVE study. And the aims of EVE are to monitor the incidence of COVID in the population, understand risk factors for disease, um, and uh, importantly, enable real world analyses of the uptake, safety, and effectiveness of vaccination and treatments. A lot of the outputs from EVE are not necessarily in the public domain in the form of papers. Um, this is EVE is used to uh, underpin a lot of rapid analyses, uh, um, the results of which go to Scottish and UK government advisory committees. But one um, paper that is in the public domain and has been getting some uh, interest over the last week or so is uh, pre presents the first um, national information on the effectiveness of COVID vaccination once the vaccines rolled out to a population. So this is post-implementation observational evidence to supplement the initial um, evidence of vaccine efficacy coming from the clinical trials. And this is important, this kind of post-implementation, post-marketing surveillance is important because it provides uh, additional information on uh, effectiveness of vaccination, perhaps in groups, for example, that were not well represented um, in the initial trial cohorts. So what this uh, information, this paper is just available uh, as a Lancet preprint at the moment. So what this shows is the uptake of vaccination from the 8th of December, when the programme started up to the middle of February, it shows the percentage of population and vaccinated over time by age group. And of course, reflecting the rollout program and the eligible, eligible groups, um, uptake increased in the oldest age groups first, and then progressively uh, in the slightly younger age groups, um, with a much more gradual increase in amongst working age adults um, so far. And obviously, that's reflecting um, people, individuals who are getting vaccinated uh, due to their occupational exposure or clinical extreme vulnerability. And this graph summarizes the estimated vaccine effect of the first dose. So this is just looking at the, at the initial single dose of COVID vaccination against, um, in terms of protecting against COVID requiring hospitalization. And the results are shown um, by the length of time following that first, when the first dose of vaccination was given. So the first estimate is um, for the period seven to 13 days post vaccination. And at that point, um, uh, the best estimate is that around 50% effectiveness in terms of preventing COVID requiring hospitalisation, with the estimate of effectiveness increasing over time up to um, over 80% by uh, 28 to 34 days post vaccination. And slightly less um, precise estimates for longer time lags reflecting the fact that there are relatively few people who've had their vaccination six or more uh, have had more than six weeks follow-up post-vaccination. And I, importantly in the paper as well, uh, the, the results were also split according to the two currently offered vaccines, the Pfizer and the Oxford AstraZeneca, and by age group, uh, looking at working age adults, 65 to 79 year olds and 80 and over year olds, and finding very similar results across all those groups, which is clearly very 
encouraging. So um, moving on to th just to give a little mention to the COP study. This is one that's um, particularly close to my heart. This is the study that I'm personally leading. Um, COP stands for COVID-19 in pregnancy in Scotland. Um, COPS is a sub-study of the EVE study specifically focused on pregnant women. And within COPS, um, we are working, bringing together a complex data linkage to establish a dynamic cohort of women in Scotland who've been pregnant at any point since the beginning of the pandemic. And we're using established and novel data to do that, including the new antenatal booking data and bespoke extracts from GP um, systems on women who had early pregnancy loss. And we'll use that data infrastructure to monitor the incidence of COVID in pregnancy and quantify its impact on um, maternal pregnancy and baby outcomes. And COPS will also be used to support real world analyses of the uptake and safety and effectiveness of vaccination amongst pregnant women, um, given that pregnant, uh, vaccination for high risk pregnant women uh, officially launched a couple of weeks ago in Scotland. And over the longer term, COPS will also be able to um, support longer term follow up of women or babies who've been affected by COVID um, if required. So moving on to think about the wider impact of COVID. So we're we're very clear in Public Health Scotland that the harms associated with COVID are not just those directly associated with infection. Um, so we are maintaining uh, what we call a wider impact of COVID uh, dashboard, and that's the wider impact on population health and healthcare utilization. Um, there's lots of reasons to think that uh, why COVID might have changed, uh, influenced uh, population health and healthcare utilization beyond just the infection itself. There's um, been a lot of disruption and changes to healthcare delivery, particularly around disruptions to elective care. Um, it's, the pandemic has changed how people interact with the health service and, and healthcare seeking behavior. And whether that's a feeling, you know, higher thresholds before seeking care, either because people have this sense of wanting to protect and not overburden the NHS, or because of fear of infection. And the infection and the associated control measures um, have, you know, it's, it's obvious to see how they can affect the wider determinants of health. For example, the social isolation disruption to employment and family incomes, uh, changing patterns of physical activity, substance misuse and so on. So th through the dashboard, we try and um, we release updates monthly and we try to provide as near to real time analysis of routine national data as possible. But a lot of um, the indicators are already being developed and are available through the dashboard, shown some of the general ones here and um, recognising the audience today focused, uh, given a bit more detail about the mental health focused indicators. And I have been responsible for development of um, specific indicators on uh, maternal and child health. And again, um, recognizing the audience, I'm just showing here some as uh, briefly showing some of the information on from the mental health indicators. So this is just a straightforward count of patients um, being started on a new course of selected uh, mental health uh, medications uh, per week by their GP and results are shown for antidepressants, um, for uh, anxiolytics and for insomnia medicines. Um, we can, there are always big dips in prescribing around Christmas, which can be ignored, um, but the, particularly looking at the antidepressant prescribing, a fairly stable rate of patients being started on antidepressants pre-pandemic 
and then an enormous fall um, in, associated in time with the first lockdown towards the end of March last year, and a gradual recovery in numbers um, towards, but still not being at pre-pandemic levels. And this uh, is a similar type of graph, but now showing the, num the weekly number of individuals attending A&E departments um, with mental health problems, shown by age group, with um, the young working age adults having the highest number of attendances. And again, a similar pattern of a very sharp drop uh, in the number of attendances around the time of the initial lockdown, with some recovery but still quite um, far below what would be ex um, seen as uh, normal pre-pandemic. And the, the, um, the dashboard itself, I guess, is not research as such, but uh, I would emphasize that all the data that's used to build the visualizations on the dashboard is available for download through the dashboard. There's a very simple download the data button and you can take all the data out. Uh, this is aggregate data, I should say, not individual patient level data. Um, you can take that data out uh, in simple Excel format. And a number of academics have partnered with us to, um, con to download the data and conduct more formal analyses um, and publish papers um, on that. So this is just an example from the first paper that was published using the dashboard data. It uses uh, interrupted time series modeling to quantify um, the fall in uh, and subsequent recovery in A&E attendances, overall levels of A&E attendance, emergency admission and elective admission over the first half of last year. So moving on to the final section, just thinking about uh, contribution to international studies. Um, everything I've spoken about so far has been very much within Scotland, using Scotland's data to inform Scotland's response to the pandemic. But we're also looking out more broadly, um, and there's an, a number of international studies on the go. I've selected IPOP uh, as a, the exemplar that I'm uh, most familiar with and involved with. So IPOP is the International Perinatal Outcomes in the Pandemic Study. It's looking at uh, to assess the extent to which uh, COVID and all its associated control measures, so lockdown for short, and how that's affected perinatal outcomes, in particular preterm birth and stillbirth. And there's emerging evidence that lockdown has affected those outcomes, and sometimes not in the ways that you would expect, so preterm birth going down quite a lot during the, pan, the early phases of the pandemic, at least, at least in high income settings, um, possibly uh, related to um, lower incidence of other non-COVID infections in women or improved air quality and so on. So IPOP has a global focus. Each country that's um, joined the study is um, running its own analyses and contributing fine-grained aggregate data. Um, to a central study database and then uh, the study team will run interrupted time series analysis for each country and bring those together in planned meta-analysis. So I just want to, um, coming to the end, just to sum things up, I mean first of, of course what I want to say is that in no way at all am I presenting the range of work that I've discussed as all my own work. This has been a really big team effort within um, Public Health Scotland um, with existing staff but also with um, external academics, some of whom had pre-existing honorary contracts with us and some of whom have taken on honorary contracts with us during the pandemic to strengthen our ability to run these studies, including many colleagues from the University of Edinburgh. And their input's been really um, valuable. So just to wrap up, I hope I've left you with a sense of Public Health Scotland's role and the range of uh, national data that we hold, and um, how as part of the pandemic, we've tried to develop 
uh, our national data um, within the bounds of existing um, governance rules. The research really has been an integral part of our response to the, to the pandemic. It's not always been um, a very planned or, um, you know, sometimes it's been a messy process with multiple strands of work, but all being done simultaneously and in a collaborative way. And the research outputs have really been important in forming my more health protection focused colleagues and their decision making and the guidance that they're providing to other decision makers, including in government around um, risk factors, transmission control, vaccination. So I hope that's been helpful. I'm happy to take any questions. Brilliant. Thanks very much, uh, Rachel. That was that was super. Um, yeah, so if anybody wants to ask a question, uh, there are various ways of doing it. You can pop by your question in the chat box and I'll read it out, or I might just uh, ask you to unmute your microphone and camera and show yourself and ask the question yourself. So, so feel free to do that. Um, feel free to, to put it in, put your question in the chat box. So uh, that would be great. So just, um, do you mind if I uh, just ask a quick question, Rachel, about the, about the work? Sure. So um, some of the occupations that you were, uh, you were discussing, I mean, those two are of great interest, aren't they? I guess there are others like uh, uh, bus drivers and, and other people who are public facing. Uh, and there was a, I don't know to what extent it's possible to identify data but there's, from those groups, but the, there's been talk about linking to HMRC or to Department of Work and Pensions uh, data in the past. And as, as far as I know, nobody's done it. I just wonder if it had been mooted in, 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 when you were thinking about conducting the study. Yes, well, you're right, Andrew. Of course, there are lots of other occupational groups of interest. I, um, and in some ways, what we've done, it's been very much the art of the possible and healthcare workers and teachers are two groups, A, that are of very key interest, um, but also there are central national um, sources of finding information in, uh, on the, the individuals in those settings. I would be really interested to look at some of the other what, frontline worker groups. There's no I'm not aware of specific plans to do that, but we're certainly, um, you know, it's certainly of interest. I know that the ONS uh, have produced a lot of information at UK or England and Wales level on a mortality risk by occupation, because of course the one type of record that we do have occupational information on is our, our death records. So um, there is that information there, but looking at the other outcomes um, other than death, it, it's really difficult by occupation. Okay, thanks. So Sue Fletcher Watson is displaying the other manner of asking a question, which is to raise your hand. So that, that alternative is also available to you. So Sue. Hi, Rachel. That was um, exactly as fascinating as I had hoped it was going to be. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to ask what you think about the kind of legacy of the pandemic for um, data science in general as applied to kind of other research questions and and I guess for pandemic preparedness because you know none of us want to do this again um do you think there have been kind of big strides made do you think there are um things that we could do later to be in a better position in the future or, or to make better use of the data that we have yes I think I think that's a, it's a really good question Sue and I hope that we have learned through this. I hope we're not just all so exhausted by the end of it, we just <laughs> collapse in a heap and hope it never happens again, because we do need to um, make sure that we learn and some things have gone more smoothly than others, of course. Um, I think from my personal point of view, I'm very keen that the COPS study has a very specific legacy we never, although even back in the swine flu pandemic, um, which really affected pregnant women very badly, unlike, um, thankfully, COVID hasn't. Um, but we 
didn't really learn from that and we didn't have the existing infrastructure in place to rapidly uh, do the complex linkage required that's to establish this dynamic cohort of pregnant women. And I really hope that we um, put that that we maintain that um, capability in as a kind of sleeper study um, sort of approach after this pandemic. There are other things that I think we need to learn and that are being learned. So for example, the quality of data on ethnicity in routine health records is has not been good. Um, and it's that's frankly not acceptable anymore. Now we've seen um, the impact that COVID has had on uh, some uh, differential impact by ethnicity. So there are already steps in place to improve that. I think one of the other issues, it's taken much longer to set up the EVE study. Eve, ironically, even though EVE was the sleeper study and REACT wasn't, REACT was much quicker to be set up than EVE. And part of that is because even though Eve was a sleeper study, it was very, very time consuming to get the GP data in. And so our lack of access to good quality primary care data uh, is something else I think we need to tackle. Great, thank you. We have another couple of uh, questions. So I'm going to take uh, Rob McCabe first. So Rob, can you, uh, do you want to unmute yourself and, and ask your, Ask your question. Oh, there. Hi. Um, thank you, Dr. Wood. I enjoyed your presentation. I thought your graphics were very clear. Um, I wonder if, if you, by virtue of hearsay of talking with other colleagues in public health, have heard anything about any evidence for a sustained increase in mental health admissions in Scotland since the pandemic started? There has not been an increase in mental health admissions to my knowledge. Um, I'm, I'm not a psychiatrist and that isn't specifically on the dashboard at the moment, but I think rather we've seen this um, counterintuitive reduction in uh, care seeking for, for mental health, um, which, you know, and then of course it becomes very difficult to disen um, entangle, uh, disentangle um, need actual need and clinical um what's going on with people clinically uh, compared to healthcare seeking behavior and how accessible services are and those things get very wrapped up and difficult to disentangle so i'm not um suggesting that the fact that we saw we definitely saw a big reduction in uh, mental health prescribing and mental health and presentation of uh, mental health distress and acute problems to A&E at the beginning of lockdown. I'm not suggesting that that uh, necessarily should be taken, that there was a reduction in population need. Thank you for that. In my in actual question in the chat box, I, I asked Andrew or any of the other psychiatrists if they wanted to comment from their real well, life. So Andrew Watson, I've just uh, I've just poked him in the chat box uh, just because I, I know that he'll be at the, he'll know everything about the <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, grand. Yep. Um, yeah, I guess it's um, we did see a fall off after the first lockdown. Um, when for the first time in, in a long time we were below 100% occupancy for many of our, our wards, but that does suggest one of the challenges about measuring demand on the fixed resource of inpatient beds because the minute you hit 100%, then it's hard to kind of show that much more demand yeah. when you're full. Um, we have seen a slight increase in admissions and discharges to keeping pace to that. Um, but yeah, really since, since uh, oh, I don't know, June last year, we've kind of been back to normal business in terms of the, the demand for the inpatient wards. What we have seen interestingly is in the home treatment team in Edinburgh, which of course doesn't have a caseload cap to the same extent that the inpatient service does. They have been busier. There's more demand and more psychosis on their caseload. So um, that's perhaps a place where we could maybe see acuity and demand more easily would be the intensive home treatment services rather than the fixed resource for the inpatient, inpatient ward. Great, thank you. Uh, Lizzie and then Matthew, uh, if possible. So Lizzie, do you want to ask your question or is it being covered? 
just to say, I, I think it's pretty much been covered. Um, okay. At the, yeah, it just my, I suppose I wanted to ask about whether you, the media seems to be giving quite a strong impression that there's a huge new wave of mental illness, and that didn't seem to be coming across in the data that you presented. But perhaps mm. it's it's a a case of um, some some things going up and other things going down, maybe. Well, I think I would just to sort of reiterate my previous response, I think what I'm showing is patterns of healthcare utilisation, which are very influenced by um, how services are offered and how people interact with those services and how available the services are. I think if you want to understand um, issues like uh, such as trends in mental well-being in the wider population that requires different kinds of data for example um, repeat survey data some of which has gone on I'm totally straying out of my area of comfort now um, around maternal and child health so others might wish to to contribute but I think um, it would be those kinds of data um, those more population-based uh, direct assessment data that you need to, to look at trends in mental mental well-being great so um matthew um can we come to you next yeah it was just uh about the gp gp data I, I was very impressed that when you said all gp surgeries um i was very surprised uh, um yeah it was just i guess checking whether you think things will get better when spire comes in whenever spire does come in um and whether it will be incorporated into the kind of data mines that you already have? Yes, I think things will get better. I mean, uh, I have to say that the only way for Eve to the um, GPs collectively enabled uh, delegated decision making on that the Eve extract to their representatives. So the uh, BMA GP committee and the Royal College of GPs, which is the only way feasibly you can negotiate um, around uh, an entire population extract. And that, um, so some of our GP colleagues have been very helpful in, in supporting Public Health Scotland to do that, it, even though it was really, you know, it was tricky. Um, and I think, it, as I said to Sue, I think better and more streamlined access to primary care data is uh, definitely needs to be one of the legacies um, and I think colleagues here in Public Health Scotland and in the wider academic community are very aware of that. I'm not whether SPIRE is going to be the answer or whether we're going to be in some kind of um, new game I'm not I think that is not entirely clear just yet. Thanks. Thank, thank you. Can I ask a quick question about sensitisation and public engagement around the accessing of, of health service em employment data? So you, you've, you've been able to identify people who are employed as health service staff. And in normal times, I think PVPP would have expected you to consult with, with possibly with unions, possibly make some sort of uh, advert of your intention to do this so that people knew that it was going on. What, what, was the, uh, what was the process for accessing that data? Did you get any pushback or was it straightforward or what? It was fairly straightforward for within the health service. Um, the, we had to do a data, as I say, there had to be a data privacy impact assessment um, and done as approved by our data protection officer and all the boards had to agree to release those data to us. Um, and we needed a PVAP approval to link the data. Uh, and we do need to be transparent about what we're doing. So making sure that um, information on these studies is uh, available on the Public Health Scotland website and so on. The process for the getting the teaching data was slightly different and the General Teaching Council did write to every teacher in Scotland offering an individual oh, sure. um, ability to opt out and extremely few did. That's that's great. That's uh, that, that's really interesting. So um, I'll so I'll ask you a question, Ken, if you don't mind. 
rather than rather than asking you to read it out. But I, I think Ken's uh, question, so he pays you a compliment in that he had the choice of David Porteous or, or your lecture, but he decided to come to yours and he's glad he did. So I think that's high, high praise. Uh, but he also asks um, how, when, how long the research will go on for. Do you think it will come to an end at the end of the population vaccination or, or as, as I sort of fear, it'll go on for much longer than that? Yeah, and that, it's an interesting question. Um, I think, so if I talk about um, the COP study, for example, for pregnant women, which is uh, more, uh, you know, what I'm very much involved in, we, I think you have to be proportionate and you have to understand when you've answered your question of interest and, uh, and some will end sooner than others. So for example, uh, in COPS, our plan is we're currently working on what we're calling a first wave cohort. So this is women that were pregnant um, at the beginning of March and became pregnant up until the end of July. And we're following that group through to, to get initial estimates um, of the impact of COVID on outcomes of interest. And we're planning to do a repeat analysis um, what we're calling the full cohort, which is um, women becoming pregnant right up until the end of this month, actually, so um, the current financial year. And I guess what we're hoping is that cohort, of course, there's always there's a huge lag in these pregnancy analyses because you have to wait the nine months um, before the baby to be born and those uh, outcomes to be known. Um, but I think my hope is that that cohort, women um, that became pregnant over that period, they will have the highest proportion of uh, highest risk of exposure to COVID during their pregnancy. I hope that the, the infection will be at least better controlled going forward. So that group is going to give us um, reasonably precise and certain estimates of the impact of COVID on the outcomes of interest. And I wouldn't anticipate, even if some infections in pregnancy continue to accrue, I wouldn't expect to continue monitoring the outcomes uh, indefinitely. I think monitoring the incidence of infection is a different issue, and that's not research, that's just part of what we do in Public Health Scotland and in terms of population health monitoring. We monitor flu, I think we're going to monitor COVID ad infinitum, but the sort of specific, answering specific research questions, try and put some boundary around that. Yeah. Uh, obviously, um, then our next, uh, within COPS, the next phase of interest will be specifically around vaccine safety in, in pregnancy, and I'm working on that very actively at the moment. And again, we'll need to see, wait and see uh, at the moment, only relatively small numbers of pregnant women are getting vaccinated. Um, that may expand. So again, we'll make a judgment as to when we've when we've answered the questions that well, need to be answered. Thanks, Rachel. Sue is dying to ask a question before she oh. has to head off. So I wonder if I could just uh, give Sue the last question, and then we'll we'll wrap things up. Hi. Sorry, Rachel. I couldn't resist. Um, me again. Um, I was really struck by the the teacher data, right? And I'm sure um, many people have been, and particularly the contrast with the fact that certainly on kind of social media and colloquially, it seems to me that a lot of teachers are still very scared about, you know, now going back into the classroom. Um, and I just wondered what your thoughts were on how we can kind of communicate these kinds of findings better to the public to help them with their decision making and reassure mm -hmm. them when that's appropriate and, and so on. Yeah, it's a good question. And the, of all the work that I've been involved in, the risk to teachers has probably been um, the most, I don't want to say difficult, but well, difficult <laughs> because of the, um, the very polarized views um, that there are uh, with a lot of people having very firm a priori views on level of risk that are difficult to shift with, um, with evidence. And that is quite a difficult space to be working in. 
and I think it's it is really important that we communicate in a gentle and um, clear and truthful manner the evidence that we're uh, accumulating and provide reassurance where that's reasonable but also I, I mean I did a very um, I did a a public webinar on risk to teachers to try and address some of these issues and then um, I think it's been very clear that you're not trying to polarize this debate it's not we're not saying there's no risk to teachers and of course all the um, systems to control infection need to be in place in schools and teachers just as anyone else deserves the best protection that can be afforded to them at work but alongside that there is a reassuring message that they don't appear to be at uh, increased risk uh, of severe infection. So I think you're right that it's um, we have done some public engagement some of which has been um, quite challenging to do but I think it's important that we do it. Absolutely. Thank Great. you. Thanks. Well, Amanda is fascinated by your your. <laughs> yes. you're, you're, you're channeling the inner Bond villain there. See, that's great. Um, we'll 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 draw things to a close now, Rachel. But just, I mean, I think you can tell by the number of questions you've. Uh, this has caused a great deal of interest, and I'm sure we could go on for a considerable period of time uh, asking you further questions and and grilling you grilling you more. But uh, maybe uh, people m might be able to get in touch with you by email or might be able to reach out to you in other ways. But um, and the video is being recorded, so uh, hopefully at some point, with your agreement, we can we can put it online for people who yeah, weren't able that, to meet. That's well. fine. Great. Well, thanks for having me. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Cheerio. Cheerio. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, Rachel.